Hello, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today and our program for our program, Assessment and Management of Women with Benign Breast Conditions, Abnormal Uterine Bleeding, and STIs. If you have any questions or anything about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on the screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts, sign-in sheet, and evaluation are all available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access those materials. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this program, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While the content may continue to be relevant, CE credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses expiring November the 30th, 2016, and two years for social workers expiring November the 30th, 2017. I'm Beth Nichols, the ADPH Nurse Practitioner Director, and with me today are Beth Allen, Deborah Davis, and Nasa Hernandez, all Nurse Practitioner Seniors with the Bureau of Family Health Services. Welcome everyone, and now we'll get started with Beth's presentation. Good morning to all. I hope this finds you doing well this morning. Today, for program objectives for myself, we want to discuss and define benign breast disease with emphasis on pathophysiology and clinical management. We want to outline clinical presentation of varied benign breast diseases needed follow-up assessment plan. So I know that today, um, out in our ADPH clinics, you're getting some downtime. So with thoughts of downtime and maybe wanting to be on a stranded island, <laughs> um, at least your uh, focus can be on a little bit of, of educational purposes for the day. So I want to start off with a definition for b benign breast disease. Um, knowledge of common breast problems are an essential part of our practice. We are a primary source of breast care for the women in Alabama. Benign breast disease is much more than breast cancer, and breast, benign breast disease is the most common that we see. I'm going to talk about today clinical presentation for benign breast disease. And if you think about clinical presentation of benign breast disease, um, it is critical when we look at the clinical presentation to think of the process as a two-step process. We teach that, we um, actually instruct our patients regarding that, and as far as um, that part of the process, and, and just want to emphasize that that inspection is so important in the part of that two-step process. A large proportion of office visits in the nation in women's health care are around benign breast disease. Benign breast disease may represent subclinical breast cancer. Um, in other words, breast cancer has to be on our differential diagnosis list. Um, we should always have in the back of our mind that this can be a possibility when we're dealing with our patients. And for purposes of this presentation, um, when you find a breast problem, then obviously we're still going to need to refer these patients and have a diagnostic workup. But we just want to go through the different types of benign breast conditions. This is a good jumping off point, and so just wanted to start today with normal breast composition. And um, you can see this, and we've seen this through the years in many textbook type of diagrams of the breast tissue. But the breast tissue is very intricate. And, you know, uh, you can tell that, and if you go from the back to the front, starting with the ribs and the chest wall and the pectoralis major muscle, you can see the Cooper's ligaments there, which are our um, actual supportive tissue in our breast. And then if you start from the nipple, where you have the single ducts, 
the major ducts that then proliferate into the small ducts and then that terminate into the lobes and lobules where the milk production is actually made. You can see this process through the breast tissue as an in-depth process here. This um, pictorial actually shows through the years and through our development how that duct actually and our ducts actually proliferate um, and differentiate. This uh, picture shows the breast gland and um, this is unique to sort of, sort of show the detail of the lobes and the lobules which is eight to ten sections arranged in like a petals of a daisy as you see the analogy there. I thought this was just really good to show us um, how the structure of our breasts with our lobes and our lobules and then of course through the lobules at the end tiny sacs called bulbs are where the milk production comes from. Another very important part of breast composition is the lymphatic system of our breasts. We teach this and greater than 75 percent of the lymphatic drainage is in the axillary area of our breast uh, lymphatic system. So you can see this pictorial as very um, involved lymphatics. We certainly teach on self breast exam to also check the supra and infraclavicular node area and we want to do that as well as, as, well as the axillary area. When we're talking about benign breast disease um, congenital anomalies are a part of this process. That includes aberrant breast tissue, amastia, and inverted nipple. Inversion of the nipple, um, I'll start off with, can happen at birth and uh, usually resolves and not considered an abnormal entity uh, within the first couple of days. Aberrant breast tissue comes in several forms. You can have the accessory nipple, which you see here, and um, it can align itself in the milk line of development from the axillary all the way into the growing. It can come in different forms uh, as far as presentation. There can actually be breast tissue with this nipple uh, in the supernumerary type of form. This is axillary accessory breast tissue. We do see this. Just wanted to show a picture of this as well because um, you know, if this has always been a finding of theirs, it may not be an abnormal. Certainly it does have to be explored if it's a new finding. And this is a mastia, and I want to talk just a minute about a mastia. It's no breast development. It's generally considered a developmental issue that does have several conditions of association. When we see these patients, we ought to be thinking, uh, that there's abnormal development going on. And when we see these patients at a young age, typically other issues are going on. They may actually come in and say they're not having menstrual cycles as associated to this. And so we want to explore that with them. Several conditions are associated with the mastia. Poland syndrome, which is one of those um, conditions, actually has abnormalities of the skeletal makeup, it has ab abnormalities of the ribs, radial nerve palsies, and can be associated with uh, increased risk for breast cancer, which, you know, that's something you might not think of with someone who doesn't have breast tissue. Um, and another um, association is Turner syndrome, and Turner syndrome are patients who have a short stature. They um, have a webbed um, type of neck appearance. Um, they also, uh, it's a chromosomal condition that they also can have lymphadenopathy with. And so these types of things need referral. We need to know that this is abnormal development and that they need to get further care. A major part of our role in all of these type of anomalies is reassurance to our patient. Uh, we're generally dealing with the adolescent patient. This may be something that you see more in adulthood. But generally, um, you've got a mom coming in with a daughter who's saying, we don't have a period, and you know we're 17 years old, what's going on here? And, and you find this as well. So just getting those, uh, giving those patients and moms some reassurance about you know, there can be help with these. 
When this is caught, you know, at an early age, at puberty, there can be hormonal treatment um, that's given, and it will help uh, resolve some of these issues. So just talking about development, these are the Tanner stages. We've seen these textbook for years. I just wanted to give this as a brief refresher and, you know, as guidance. Uh, one of the things we wanted to point out today is, uh, of course, just let me mention that Tanner stage one is no breast development all the way to Tanner stage five, which is complete adult breast development. Um, this also gives the genitalia tanner staging one through five as well. And, and with this, just one point of reference might be to include this in your adolescent documentation on your physical exam. So talking more with our special adolescent population disorders that you may see with benign breast disease, that includes asymmetry, macromastia, hypoplasia, tuberous breast development, and gynecomastia. Um, these types of things, uh, again, part of our role is reassurance, um, referral, and, and, but um, these types of things can be very marked, you know, they can be very severe. And asymmetry is basically uneven breast tissue. Macromastia is where in the juvenile years that the breast development can be per breast 30 pounds each. So these patients obviously need help. They need referral. They may, they may certainly need surgical uh, reduction and um, treatments for any comfort measures there. Hypoplasia is underdevelopment of the breast tissue and it itself um, can be linked to problems like anorexia. So with our patients, we want to think down some of these roads when, when the breast tissue is underdeveloped. Tuberous breast development is actually um, an enlarged nipple areola area um, that has a tube-like or elongated uh, underdeveloped breast tissue. It actually appears totic as you uh, do their breast exam and something to you know talk to them about and reassure them. Gynecomastia is breast development in males. Just to show you some moderate uh, asymmetry, this picture I thought depicted that well. Obviously, this is the elephant in the room, right? So when we see this with a patient, we shouldn't ignore it. We should go there. We should um, you know, explore it with them and reassure them that there can be some conservative cosmetic types of measures that you can do for that um, and, and teach them how, you know, that they can get the pads that go in the bras to support that and things of, of that nature. When it's this moderate and marked, marked, you know, we will be obviously referring them for, for reasons needed. But when it's mild, we can tell them that with development, a lot of this will self-correct, about 75% of it. Um, also, we have a picture here of gynecomastia. Okay, one of the main um, presentations that we have with benign breast disease is nostalgia. We may encounter this every day. It's high on the, you know, complaint concern list when our patients come in. It is a great teaching moment and usually has explainable reasons. And, and so f for that reason, we do need to explore some history with nostalgia. We need to think about non-related breast issues as well as hormonal related breast issues and things such as caffeine that they could be taken in. Um, in talking to them about that explainable type of nostalgia, it's typically related to the cycle. And so teaching them that point that your breasts are going to be tender as your hormones change at cycle time is a vital part to, to our um, population that doesn't. And this happens through the ages. This isn't just an adolescent issue. We have adults coming in with this because it varies and it can vary. Um, nostalgia itself is 
not a risk for breast cancer, but if the patient continues to come in, there may be associations that we're not picking up on. And after about you know six months, you probably want to refer this patient for um, needed evaluation there. Some of the easy remedies to teach them about, I think most of us know, vitamin E, um, primrose, um, certainly good support like sports bras, but a new thing that ACOG actually recommended by study is flaxseed, 50 grams daily, you know, which in the seed form they could put on various meals and things that they eat. So that might be an easy um, thing to teach for us to start um, letting our patients know. And where that's concerned, ACOG actually recommended flaxseed over vitamin E at this present time. So here's just a listing of differential diagnosis to explore. Costochondritis we see fairly common and, you know, chest wall types of pains. Obviously, referral as needed for medical conditions. I'm not going to go through each one of these. And, um, you know, if somebody's presenting with chest pain, MI has to be on our list and appropriate referral thereafter. All right, so coined with mastalgia is certainly fibrocystic breast change. Fibrocystic um, change is actually a normal variant. And the reason I want to say it that way is years in years past, it was referred to as fibrocystic breast disease. Fibrocystic change is not disease. It's actually change in the structure of the breast tissue. We definitely see this daily in clinic, in clinical breast examinations. And so this is something we need to become familiar with. It is that classic lumpy, bumpy, bilateral bre breast tissue that has pattern of tenderness, you know, sometimes monthly. It can, you know, improve and get worse at times and usually that is also related to the cycle with um, these patients. Um, as far as the way it feels, the lumpy bumpy is, is a way that that can be described and taught to them as their normal variant. Um, a good way for us to term that is bilateral nodular breast tissue that's consistent with the normal breast exam. Just to talk about fibrocystic breast condition um, in relation to um, screening mammogram and the voucher, I just, I just wanted to go over this briefly. Um, if you have a clinical breast exam and uh, you are finding bilateral nodular breast tissue that's consistent with the normal breast exam, that is considered a normal exam. So certainly when you're sending them for screening mammogram, then you would you could would mark normal exam. You could also and would also mark benign findings, not suspicious for cancer. Um, another category uh, of benign findings just in my thought process of this is something that's subcutaneous that actually is not into the breast tissue itself. You do want to note that because that's part of what they're evaluating when they do their screening mammogram. So it's important to put those findings on there. But if a patient has a discrete palpable mass, then we should not be marking normal exam or benign findings. That's different. So we shouldn't say in our clinical breast exam, discrete palpable mass, and then order by mammogram, normal exam, and benign findings. Um, we've talked some about this with Dr. Thomas, and um, I just thought I would let her just describe some circumstances since she's so familiar with this that we come across with um, as far as discrete palpable mass versus um, bilateral nodular tissue. Thank you, Beth. Just, just to add to, to what you have um, so eloquently described, I think it's the importance here is to note that if you do palpate a discrete mass, you've got to order a diagnostic study. So you can't order a screening study if you have palpated a, a mass in the breast, a discrete uh, palpable mass. And that's the only thing I wanted to add to that. Okay. 
Um, if we have any, if y'all have any questions about that at the end of our program, Dr. Thomas is here to answer those questions, but so is Beth Nichols and Tina Pippin who are with us today in our audience. Um, we just want to go ahead and talk about mastitis. Um, mastitis comes in basic two forms, lactational and non-lactational types of mastitis infection. Both lactational and non-lactational primarily are from due to skin organisms such as Strep B, Staph, Staph A, and E. coli. Non-lactational um, infections actually include periductal mastitis, breast cellulitis, epidermal cyst, and granulomatosis mastitis. Granulomatosis mastitis um, is actually something I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about because it's an inflamed type of breast tissue that can mimic cancer. Um, it's, it's not classic in that empiric therapy it usually doesn't respond to. So therefore, it's important to get these um, evaluated. A core needle biopsy is needed for these patients for this uh, granulomatosis tissue. Um, and as far as the presentation, it often waxes and wanes, so it's something that's persistent throughout their life. It can uh, improve with steroids. Um, it may not. It may have some relief with non-steroidal analgesics. And just to sort of note the seriousness of, of this type of condition, um, right now under investigation, tamoxifen and methotrexate are under investigation to help treat our patients who might have this. Typical lactational mastitis appears like this in clinical presentation. So the patient comes in usually within six weeks postpartum, and they have erythematous, edematous, indurated, very painful, um, unilateral, usually it can be bilateral, um, type of tissue that presents this way. Um, when we see this, this um, obviously should throw up a lot of red flags um, because with mastitis, lactating, and non-lactating, they can mimic inflammatory breast cancer. So I just wanted to also let Dr. Thomas talk to us just a minute. Um, and before you say that, the, the, um, the inflammatory breast cancer is something that's very aggressive, and statistically it's 1 to 5 percent of the breast cancers that we see of all breast cancers. So, Dr. Thomas, yeah. did you want to talk to us about that? Just briefly, as, as, as Beth, uh, just to reiterate what Beth has said, um, inflammatory breast cancer is a rare finding. It's less than 5% of all breast cancers. I think, it, you know, the important point to stress here is that we need to, you know, be on high alert whenever we see patients who present with this finding, whether they're lactating, uh, moms or, or they are non-lactational. Um, here in the health department, many of you know that, that we've seen patients with inflammatory breast cancer, patients as, as young as, as you know, post-adolescent patients. So we should, um, we should have a heightened awareness for this type of uh, finding in the breast tissue. Typically and generally speaking, you know, Beth described um, lactational mastitis as, as the breast being tender, and, and uh, with inflammatory breast cancer, in general, the breasts tend to not be tender. So that's just something to keep in mind when, when you're trying to um, differentiate. And I think it's reasonable um, with consultation to place these patients on antibiotics for a short period of time but keeping in mind that we have got to have some way of following up with our patients. These are, you've got to have a tickler system, you've got to be in touch with your patients because you don't want these patients slipping through the cracks for the, for the reasons that, that have been mentioned. So you've got to, you know, you can manage with, with uh, antibiotics, you know, to see if that will make a difference, but you've got to be in touch with your patients because clearly they may need referral and a biopsy and a, and a full surgical workup. 
Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And one of the things um, that we would want to, to, to know with these patients is a firm sort of number, a way to get in touch with them, and a return to clinic appointment in 48 to 72 hours, like Dr. Thomas was talking about. Okay. Uh, a part of benign breast disease is certainly nipple discharge. Nipple discharge um, is actually three, in three types, galacteria, physiologic nipple discharge, and pathologic nipple discharge. As far as um, um, physiologic, let's just start there, nipple discharge. Typically what we see is patient presenting with stimulated nipple discharge. Um, and something, a, a sure teachable moment for sure because, um, you know, they're very concerned over this nipple discharge that they've elicited. And so you want to teach the patient not to overstimulate the nipple and you want to be sure that um, they know that this can completely resolve and should completely resolve when that, when you stop doing that. You want to let them know that it's for hormonal reasons as well. Um, and that we have natural secretions in the nipple that if any of us overstimulate can produce. Uh, um, galacteria is actually um, another form of nipple discharge and it is a bilateral type of milky nipple discharge. It's considered an endocrine disorder and so therefore we should think referral. Um, when these patients present, because it can also be for hormonal reasons um, and certainly can be related to thyroid, it, you know, it's okay by our ADPH protocol to actually evaluate this with them to um, maybe do a thyroid panel, um, talk to them about measures like the stimulation, and then recheck them in six to eight weeks, and certainly if it's still ongoing at that time, refer them. And then pathologic nipple discharge is where our heightened sense um, should be around nipple discharge. It presents as bloody discharge. It is spontaneous. So it is of great concern when we have a patient that presents this way. Of course, uh, cancer has to be in our thought process. Um, as far as uh, clinical breast exam, you can see this uh, unilateral. Uh, typically, it can be bilateral, um, and it may or may not have a mass with the clinical breast exam. Without, with a mass, let me start there first. Um, it's almost always cancer um, involved with that um, presentation. Without a mass, uh, typically the number one cause for that is introductal papillomas. So. Um, Patients need to be evaluated for this. This is, of course, a diagnostic workup as well as a surgical uh, evaluation. Um, but the number one cause for nipple discharge is introductal papillomas, which is benign. Duct dysphagia is another um, type of, of uh, problem related to discharge and, and the mammary gland actually gets clogged basically and it can produce a green uh, type of discharge and usually they do have erythema and they have a lump and it presents ugly. So I wanted to show you a picture of that as well. Um, you virtually cannot differentiate this from invasive type of carcinoma as it has sort of stages of infiltration into the tissue. Since we're talking about ducts and different problems that arise, I wanted to mention hyperplasia. Um, hyperplasia is actually uh, diagnosed from histology. So you have different forms of hy hyperplasia here, ductal, lobular, and atypical. And when you see these, you should look carefully at these on our reports that we're getting back because lobular and atypical have um, a high risk for carcinoma. And with lobular and, a, and atypical, uh, often chemoprophylaxis is used to treat these. Um, so that tells you that although sometimes classified as benign, it is certainly thought to be a precursor to carcinoma and certainly can be carcinoma when we're seeing this on our reports. OK, 
Okay, so let's move into palpable breast masses. Uh, on that list is fibroadenoma, lipoma, hematoma, and phyllotes tumors. So I want to talk about fibroadenoma and just start with that. Fibroadenoma is the most common benign palpable breast mass we see. Um, and as far as presentation, it's a very solid, rubbery, uh, mobile mass, may or may not have tenderness. Um, and a lot of the literature describes it as the breast mouse because it's so mobile that you can just, you know, move it about. Um, again, as with any of these, it requires a diagnostic workup and evaluation. Um, and, you know, that's our starting point. Lipoma is enca encapsulated fat um, tissue. It can be as small as f like the comparison of a chocolate-covered raisin or as large as, you know, a golf ball. So these vary in size, but they are encapsulated fat and benign. They're classified by ultrasound, um, and there are birads too. Uh, hamartoma is actually um, growth-like um, tumor of the breast, but it can also be associated with Cowden's disease. And oftentimes with these patients, they have multiple um, growths throughout their skin. They may have it in their, um, mu um, in their mucosa. They may have it intestinal. It can be, you know, just about anywhere. It can also be um, head to toe, basically. It can also involve um, problems such as predisposition to breast, thyroid, kidney, and colorectal cancers. Philodes is um, uh, rare, but it's similar to fibroadenoma in that they're fibro fibroepithelial type of, of um, tissue. And with Philodes, it grows very rapidly. Um, it, it is um, benign, but it also can be cancer, and it can be, you know, both. So these always should give us a, a red flag type of approach when we see this. Um, this is going to be notable because of the mitotic division with this type of growth. It's going to be very rapid and the patient's going to come in complaining of a very rapid growth tumor that they've got going on or mass that they're feeling. It does warrant very close follow-up even after surgery. It's hard to get clear margins on something that grows so rapidly like this. So um, I wanted to show you just uh, a tissue uh, specimen here of the fibroadenoma since we're talking about fibroepithelial uh, tumors and then, um, more importantly, these pictures of Philodes. Um, the top picture is actually benign, and the bottom picture is actually um, the necrotic carcinoma that you can see, sarcoma there. Other forms of palpable uh, breast masses are fibromatosis, lactating adenoma, nipple adenoma, sclerosing adenosis, and granular cell tumors. Fibromatosis is a palpable breast mass that adheres to the chest wall. Uh, lactating adenoma is, um, happens during pregnancy, can grow very large, but typically do resolve thereafter. They do need to be followed. If not resolved, surgery is indicating. Uh, sclerosing adenosis is of concern. Um, this is palpable or non-palpable. It can be detected um, through calcifications noted. And with sclerosing adenosa, it has a radial scar um, and it can coexist with invasive carcinoma. So this is another red flag type of finding that you want to have a heightened sense about. Um, and of course, with masses, these, these are a referral process that needs evaluation. Granular cell tumors are benign types of growths that can grow a half to one inch, so they can be pretty significant. Um, and nipple erosion or nipple adenoma causes nipple erosion. And with that, just very hard to differentiate from Paget's disease, which is carcinoma of the breast tissue. 
just wanted to show that comparison here because either one, nipple adenoma and or pagets can um, present with uh, erosive erythematous nipple and extending out into the breast skin tissue uh, as well as the nipple. Okay. So life is like a box of chocolates. No. Life is like a bicycle. Mm. To keep your balance, you must keep on moving. So in the essence of time, let's keep on moving. Let's talk a minute about documentation of the clinical breast mass. Um, here we've described it, and in the description, just want to make sure that we include whether it's the left or right breast, the size, the shape, the consistency. Is it mobile, firm, soft, fixed? Those are the type things that we w would like to see in the, in the written documentation. Is there any induration, tenderness, um, as far as clock face position description and sonometers from the areola? This is pretty standard. We've talked about this many times, but we do recommend, a, recommend documentation in this fashion. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about this, since we're talking about benign breast disease, you wouldn't document uh, left breast cyst, okay? Cyst is a diagnostic terminology and, um, you know, requires definitive diagnosis. The better way to say that is left breast mass with all, you know, of the other details that go along with that or left breast lesion. You just want to stay away from any type of definitive diagnosis in your written documentation. Okay. So benign breast disease um, can be, you know, rather complicated for us because in our patient population and probably in a lot of patient populations, patients don't follow up our recommendations or we don't get records about their recommendations. You know, you know better than I all the obstacles you face with this. So ACOG has recently come out with recommendations with patients and I'm just, if you'll just bear with me, I'm just going to read this so that this is clear. Diagnosed benign breast conditions where the patient is not under surgical care yearly and lesions remain clinically unchanged, continue annual ultrasound, biannual clinical breast exam, and monthly self-breast exams. So, you know, they step it out that way, and um, ACOG does, and Dr. Thomas also, you know, certainly concurs that this is acceptable management plan. A couple of examples um, that we want to just sort of discuss that this would apply to. Uh, say a patient's been diagnosed with a fibroadenoma by core needle biopsy and has, and has, had, has not had surgery to remove it. And the patient is released from surgical care and they're coming back you're still palpating that area. Um, these stepped out recommendations, continue monthly self-breast exam, perform um, the clinical breast exam every six months, ultrasound um, at least yearly, and of course document this well is a reasonable way to approach these. Dr. Thomas, did you want to say anything about these patients? Yeah, the only thing I'd like to add um and, and as Beth mentioned, this can be complicated sometimes in terms of following our patients who, you know, um, in, in our setting, our patients may not follow up for a variety of re reasons. And oftentimes um, it's, it's a hardship financially for patients to do so. Um, so I think that the, the, we've got like a, 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 it's a dichotomy. We've got two branches or two um, ways we can manage these patients. I think if your patient has had, and usually we're talking about patients who are either adolescent patients or patients who are post-adolescent or in the reproductive you know, age range, and they've had a, a definitive diagnostic core biopsy that says this finding is benign, whether it's fibroadenomatous or otherwise, we can follow these patients 
with biannual exams, uh, clinical breast exams, encourage them to continue doing their monthly breast self-exams, and the recommendation is for an ultrasound to follow in terms of size. Make sure that this stays the same uh, in size with an ultrasound at least annually. Um, it's important to instruct the patient as well that if they notice any change in size, increased tenderness, that they follow up with us. And then, of course, there are the patients who do fall into this age range, um, adolescent patients who, for the reasons I've mentioned, they've got hardships and they can't see a physician, they can't see a surgeon, they can't get a core biopsy. But we know as clinicians that this is a benign lesion based on a patient's age, based on our clinical exam. And these are patients that we can follow in the same manner, uh, again, encouraging them to be in touch with us if they feel you know, that it's getting larger. Uh, and patients are often very astute about the, these things. They can tell you that their breath, you know, oh, it feels like it's getting bigger or it's about the same size. And, you know, you, you, you reassure them as well that, that, you know, they may notice some tenderness with it, that this is, you know, tends to be cyclical. And um, you follow these patients in the, same, in the same manner as you would somebody who's had a core uh, needle biopsy and definitive diagnosis. And you continue their hormonal contraception uh, more importantly. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. And, you know, just to add in thoughts of follow-up with these patients, we really need to have these in a tickler follow-up um, system so that these, you know, we never want this to get lost in the shuffle. Um, and I also just want to mention red flags of clinical breast exam. We've talked through most of this, but erythema and peau de orange that we see, uh, edema, scaling, excoriation, all these, I'm not going to read them, but these are cancer until proven otherwise, and that's what I wanted to say about that. Uh, our mammogram by BIRADS assessment categories are listed here. Zero is incomplete. One and two are negative and benign findings. Category three is probably benign findings with short-term follow-up recommended. Um, four, I just want to talk about uh, briefly, it is a suspicious abnormality. It has subcategories. 4A is low suspicion for malignancy. B is intermediate suspicion for malignancy. And C is moderate suspicion for malignancy. You'll see it stepped out this way, so I just wanted to make us all aware of that. Five is highly suspicious of malignancy. And six is actually known biopsy-proven malignancy. I want to go ahead and um, um, talk before I, um, we get in. I have a video that um, I actually saw. I don't want to go there just yet, but I just want to step this out. This, this is our hot topic item in the breast world right now. Um, there's new recommendations regarding breast screening. Um, it's conflicting between the organizations. And so we want to be clear in, in our presentation to our patients. You know, um, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And where our patients are concerned, um, they're generally not compliant, don't, you know, follow care as needed, have high-risk issues. It's complicated. And so, therefore, we certainly still recommend that their breast screening starts at 40 years and annually thereafter, that their clinical breast exams are done at 19 years old and thereafter, and that we're teaching breast self-awareness. This is ACOG's position, and this is our position as well. Just to show you the different, um, I've got this in the, in the um, handouts, just to show you the different recommendations and the variants there. Um, and in talking about this, and, and as we go to the video, uh, this is recent. I, I was actually watching the news, um, and it was on NBC News on October the 20th, 2015. And this was a wow for me. So I just wanted to show you all this, um, and then we'll talk about it thereafter. Good evening. Doctors say one in eight women in the U.S. will develop breast cancer. And so you'd be hard-pressed to find a person in this country who doesn't know someone or whose own life hasn't been touched by it. And so news today that the rules of early detection have changed virtually overnight 
has created an awful lot of worry and confusion. Here's what happened. The American Cancer Society came out today to say women need fewer mammograms starting later in life. That runs counter to what some other groups recommend. We know it raises a lot of questions. I'll put some of them to a doctor here in our studio in a moment. But first, Ann Thompson with the new guidelines. In this season of pink, the American Cancer Society moves the mammogram starting line. Instead of age 40, today it recommends women start at 45 if they are of average risk, without genetic mutations or a family history of breast cancer. At 55, women should transition to screening every other year if they have a life expectancy of 10 years or longer. The American Cancer Society says the changes are designed to eliminate false positives and over-treatment. By 45, the benefits clearly outweigh the drawbacks, and all women should participate in screening. It is also no longer recommending clinical breast exams at any age. The life-saving potential of early detection really is found in regular mammography. That's the test that can find a cancer before anybody can feel it. Yet within the health community, there's disagreement on when to start. A federal task force says it should be age 50. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists is sticking with 40. One more obstacle for Mary Solomon's mobile mammography unit to navigate as it treats uninsured women in New York City. So you were with us last year. Is this just going to add to the confusion? Oh, without a doubt. Our women are generally low income, low information consumers. So yes, this will be a very difficult thing for them to, to put their head around. Early detection helped save Mary's mother, who drove her own mammography van. Mommy. And Amy Keffer. At age 40, her very first mammogram revealed this mom had an aggressive form of breast cancer. It's frustrating for women who want to do the right thing, and they're constantly being told something different. As women and their doctors struggle with when to get screened, there may be comfort in this. Federal law requires most insurers to cover mammograms from age 40 on to protect them from the second deadliest form of cancer. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. And as I said at the top, lots of questions about this. Dr. Roshini Raj specializes in women's health and cancer screening at NYU's Langone Medical Center. Doctor, thanks for being here. Thank if you. a woman wants to go ahead and get the mammogram at 40, ignore these recommendations and go with the others, what's the harm? There's really not a big downside when you're talking about going and getting it at 40. In fact, some groups are recommending it at 40. However, the new guidelines say 45 may be more reasonable because you are going to have some false positives. That means people under 45 going to get the mammogram, something is found, they go through a lot of tests, a lot of anxiety, and in the end, it's not cancer. So that's why they said start at age 45, but they did say if you want to get it at 40, you should have the opportunity to get it at 40. What in general should women do with this information today? Well, the fact that we have three different groups recommending three different times really suggests that we don't know the exact answer for every woman. It's an individual choice. You really need to discuss it with your doctor. And let's be clear, this is for average risk women. If you have a family history, of course, if you have a personal history of another type of cancer, you really need to talk to your doctor about when you should be screened. All right, Dr. Ross, thanks. So just to intervene, you know, this is an individual assessment, and um, I thought that the video certainly was something worth showing to show the confusion that we're going to need to put at rest with our patients as far as our recommendations go. These are some slides, and I want to thank Kitty Norris and uh, Kamara uh, Satala for actually helping put these together, putting these together for me at short notice. Um, but I thought it's just, just I, I'm not a good numbers running person, but they did that for me. And I just wanted to show these numbers uh, through our breast and cervical cancer detection program in Alabama. Uh, since 2005 to now, uh, through 2014, and the nine-year history of these statistics, uh, the total CVEs is 98,538. The number of mammograms performed is 100,318. Uh, this was the part I wanted us to sort of sh show, and it's benign breast disease um, from abnormal CVEs, and that's 9,143, with breast cancer as the next slide at 1,336. So we're about a 1 to 9 ratio there. This is over the course of nine years, 
and um, I just, you know, I think sometimes statistics do show um, a lot, but when you put it uh, in a patient-by-patient -patient category, and, and these statistics, by the way, the Alabama Department of Public Health uh, approximately serves 40 to 50 percent of these patient numbers that we've seen in, in this. Um, you know, but we just thank you for what you do each and every day uh, with, with these patients. And um, I just wanted to sort of end with one thought. Where we have been is a part of our story, but where we are going tells a lot more about us. Thank you all very much. I'm going to turn this over now to Deborah Davis. This is um, a slide I took this past summer at uh, it's the Ponce Inlet Lighthouse in Daytona, Florida. And I appreciate um, everything you've taught us about benign breast disease. That's um, a really good topic that we need to know. We're going to switch gears here for just a second and talk um, a little bit about abnormal bleeding and differential diagnosis. The objectives are to define the descriptive terms used to characterize abnormal menstrual bleeding patterns and also to demonstrate utilization of differential diagnosis in development of a plan of care in a woman with abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, I want to say that I have no disclosures and I, for all of us I think that's the same. <laughs> There are, um, there is a very long list of causes for abnormal uterine bleeding. Um, and a perfect way to exemplify the way to determine the exact cause is shown in the process of differential diagnosis. Um, there are two important components to differential diagnosis. The first one is communication with our patients, and the second is eliciting a reliable history. One thing is we're discussing with our patients or talking with our patients, our clinical acuity as clinicians is very, very important. We have to pay attention to what's going on with our patients, and sometimes what we find may really surprise us. For an example, um, a while back we saw a patient in model clinic and this patient was very uncommunicative with us. She gave short answers to us when we asked questions. She said yes or no. She would shrug her shoulders and roll her eyes and just take deep breaths and it was like she really didn't want to be there. So as we were questioning her, finally we just stopped and paused. And I looked at her and I said, um, as gently as I could, tell me what's going on. There's something going on with you. And she began to cry and she told us that she was living in her car and her children had been taken away and that she was very upset and worried about her children and she missed them a lot and she wanted to, uh, she wanted to get her children back. My, my point in saying that is we have to observe our patients. We have to ask the right questions. We can't really work and talk with our patients and try to educate them about what we want to do. We have to get into the zone with them. It isn't what our agenda is, but it's what this patient needs. So we have to be in tune with her situation. So as we talk about differential diagnosis, we want to bridge the gap between the chief complaint and formulation of the correct diagnosis. We need to ask our patient, what brings you in today? That's the start of our investigation. We do this in a step-by-step -step manner. We have to be organized, we have to be succinct, and we have to be focused as we move from what the complaint the patient has to our conclusion, which is our diagnosis of their problem. The first way we do that is by really paying attention to what that complaint is. Oftentimes we see it on our public health, um, CHR 12, we see it listed at the top of the record. Uh, the patient comes in and they tell the nurse what her problem actually is. As clinicians, we need to look back and pay attention to that. It needs to bring our radar ears up. And that goes for any problems that the patient has. And so one of the things that we say as clinicians is to tell me a little bit more about what your problem is. 
We need to review um, the history of complaints that the patient has. We need to hone in on what the chronology is. We need to know everything about what her problem is, especially when it comes to bleeding. We need to know the onset, the duration. We need to know on a pain scale of zero to five, with zero being the least and five the worst, how they would characterize their bleeding or any cramping or pain that they're having. We want to gather all the data about their pattern of bleeding, at, especially when it starts and at the beginning of the complaint to um, uh, their present condition. So the questions that we have to ask are these about the onset, the location, the radiation, duration, and timing. The pattern of that bleeding is significant. How long has that bleeding been going on? One key question that we need to ask our patients is how many periods have you had over the last year? We want to know all about the aggravating or triggering factors or any alleviating things that are going on. We really especially want to know how it affects her daily life. Then we want to look and, um, at our assessment, our fiscal assessment, and the cardinal signs. Any and all symptoms need to be reviewed, and all of our questions, directed questions, need to be specific to the complaint that the patient has. We have to look at their medical history, their general medical history, and sometimes this is kind of subjective as the patient is, as we're talking with the patients. And uh, one of the key questions, as I said before, is to tell me more about your problem. Tell me more about your bleeding. And especially we have to do that with the adolescent patient. We need to know everything about them. We want to know about their family history. We want to know what their periods were like before they started having the problems with bleeding that they're having now. Their family history, the adolescent's family history, is especially important if she's having very heavy bleeding with clots. We want to know if her mother or sister or some other family member had those kinds of symptoms as well. This can be a key factor as we're trying to diagnose uh, problems like coagulopathy in these type patients. We want to look at their relevant past history, what's significant for mom, might also show up as far as bleeding in the daughter. If mom had fibroid tumors, then that may be uh, a problem with the daughter as well. We want to do a physical examination. We want to inspect and palpate, auscultate if we need to. Um, something that's really important in these patients is, is a pregnancy test. And of course, we need to do a speculum exam. Wet prep cultures could be indicated. One thing I want to make mention of is their hemoglobin. Pay attention to that hemoglobin. If they come in with a problem with bleeding, you know, we want to know what that hemoglobin is, even if it had been previously done at her annual exam. A hemoglobin of 12 is not really given an accurate picture of prolonged or heavy bleeding. We need to also look at physical um, symptoms that the patients may have. We want to look at their conjunctiva, their nail beds. We want to evaluate for heart palpitations or shortness of breath. The physical examination, again, should be directed toward the chief complaint, and the physical examination may provide an indication for, um, it may provide the diagnosis without, the, um, without additional testing. One uh, point I want to make is if the patient comes in and they do complain of spotting um, and you put in a speculum and you notice that she's got a strawberry cervix or if you touch it with a Q-tip um, and it bleeds a little bit and she has a little bit of discharge and um, the wet prep is done, she may have trichomonas and that may be key to what her diagnosis actually is. The physical examination may reveal unsuspected findings or there may, the, there may not be any findings at all that support what your original diagnosis is and so additional testing would have to be done. Additional testing could be um, starts at basic tests but it can move to more elaborate testing. We don't do elaborate testing in the public health department. But if there's some indication that this patient may need an ultrasound or an endometrial biopsy, then certainly they need to be referred out. 
These are the general lab tests that are done in the public health department. We, again, we want to do the simplest, most cost-effective um, uh, testing to uh, come to our differential diagnosis and move to the more elaborate one. Sometimes when we've exhausted everything that we can do in the public health department, then referral is the best thing for this patient, especially if there is some concern about um, clotting issues or endometrial hyperplasia. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back for just a second. Um, often we see in our QA, we see this problem as we're doing their quality assurance. Um, if you are talking to your patient and you ask some specific questions that would be pertinent to their situation, it's very important to document. And I think Beth mentioned this when it came to the breast exam as well. It's so important to document what your questions were and what the patient's answers were. The differential diagnosis compares typical symptoms associated with their medical conditions with the results discovered during the review of the patient's history and the physical exam. We want to list all possible diagnoses that we see, rank them. We want to explore every possibility that we can and keep an open mind. If the diagnosis can't be made off of the history and physical exam, then additional testing may be needed, as I said before. We want to use tests that may have an impact, um, especially on the diagnosis and ultimate treatment of the problem. Then we want to step back and reevaluate any kind of new possibilities uh, as the information arises. And then we come to our clinical decision. Whatever the conclusions might be uh, throughout everything that we've gone through, then the diagnosis usually becomes clear. A disease cannot be diagnosed if the provider doesn't know about it. So the more well-read the clinician is, the more likely they are to expand their differential diagnosis to cover something that has not been previously discovered. And this is Sunrise at Daytona Beach, Florida. And with that, we're going to take a short break. from the break. Uh, before we uh, proceed with our talk on abnormal uterine bleeding, I do want to welcome Dr. Dana Maxwell uh, here today and we just want to say thank you and welcome uh, to our program today. We're going to switch gears for a minute and um, go in another direction. I did want to show you this slide. This was one of the last final flights for the Blue Angels in, from their base in Pensacola Beach, Florida in 2014. So my talk right now is about abnormal uterine bleeding. And we want to talk about the differential diagnosis related to this uh, to AUB. I did want to mention that there are terms that are no longer used. All of these terms are old, 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 and especially dysfunctional uterine bleeding. It's no longer an accepted term uh, for us to use. 
So now we come to the terms that are accepted. In 2011, there was a new classification that was put in place, and this is supported by ACOG. This um, system helps us to determine um, areas of bleeding that are going on in non-pregnant women of reproductive age. We call abnormal uterine bleeding AUB, and heavy menstrual bleeding is AUB, HMB, and intermenstrual bleeding is AUB, IMB. So those are important terms to know. This classification system, um, the acronym for it is POM-COHEN. It identifies, it helps to simplify uh, abnormal uterine bleeding, and it gives us the terminology that we need to identify structural causes and non-structural causes. So we're going to start with POM. The P stands for polyps. The A is for adenomyosis. Adenomyosis is um, the normal lining of the uterus usually kind of grows into the muscular wall of the uterus and it's confined to the uterine muscle. It makes the uterus, uh, generally the clinical picture of that is a big, boggy, um, bulky uterus. The, e, the L is for leiomyoma, uterine fibroids. Um, and then the M is for malignancy and hyperplasia. Then we're going to talk about Cohen. The C stands for coagulopathies. Um, those things could be inherited like von Willebrand's disease or it could be acquired. Um, medications can cause acquired um, coagulopathy, things like NSAIDs, if your patients are taking NSAIDs every day or if they use other medications like warfarin, then they can have an acquired coagulopathy. The O stands for ovulatory dysfunction. We see that oftentimes with women who have PCOS. Endometrial atrophy, um, sometimes we, there are medications that can contribute to that, and Depo is one of those. Iatrogenic is introduced inadvertently by the clinician as a medical treatment or diagnostic procedure. Um, we can see that um, with IUDs or with uh, hormones like Depo as well. And the N are those that are not yet classified. They're poorly defined, they haven't been examined very well, and those are things like AV malformation or myometrial hypertrophy. These are some medications that can contribute to AUB, and as I said before, the NSAIDs, we really need to pay attention for that if our patients are frequently taking those medications for headaches. It's very important for us to know what medications the patients are taking, both over-the-counter and herbal medications. I want to, you to know that a patient can have more than one cause for abnormal uterine bleeding. This is very important for us to know. If we're trying to make a differential diagnosis, um, you know, it may be one um, that we may be considering one thing, but there may be more than one um, thing contributing to their abnormal uterine bleeding. Anovulatory bleeding is that that's characterized by heavy, irregular, and unpredictable bleeding. The causes for this can be both physiologic or pathologic. Some physiologic causes could be in adolescence where there's an immature hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, um, or it could be like perimenopause where there's a declining ovarian function. Pathologic could be hyperandrogenic anovulation or adrenal hyperplasia or some type of androgen producing tumors. That could be something like PCOS. Um, also, we need to consider thyroid disease. Other conditions could be premature ovarian failure, or it could be secondary to radiation or chemotherapy or medications. We want to talk about the normal menstrual cycle. It's important to know this when we're, um, as we're talking to our patients and trying to gather our data doing our investigation. The normal menstrual cycle, the interval lasts about 21 to 35 days, with the average being around 28 days. The duration is usually about four to six days, with the average being around five. 
And we have to remember that most of the blood lost during the menstrual period is usually the first three days. And the volume can be variable, especially um, around 30 to 35 mill millimeters, milliliters. It's important to know as we're talking to our patient, again, what their pattern of bleeding is. We need to be aware um, from adolescence through the reproductive years, from menarche through postmenopause, what those are. We want to start and know what their LMP is and lead up to their current complaint. We want to know how long their menstrual period is, how does it compare to the periods they had before, and especially how many periods they had in the last year. Dr. Thomas tells us occasionally that there are some GYN vital signs, and those important things need to be on the chart. That's their LMP, their age, their gravita, their para, and especially for the majority of our patients, a pregnancy test. It needs to be done on every patient. So let's talk about the abnormal menstrual cycle. The interval is usually less than 21 days, or it can be greater than 35 days. The duration is usually less than two days, or it can be greater than eight days, and the volume is greater than 80 milliliters. So how do we know if our patient is having excessive bleeding? It's really excessive bleeding, or she believes it is when she says it's excessive. It's, this can be a very subjective thing, but one thing for her is how does it affect her daily life? Is she soaking through her clothing? Is it disruptive? Then it can be excessive to her. As clinicians, this is a good teachable moment for our patients. If her hemoglobin is 12, it's highly unlikely that she's had prolonged and excessive severe bleeding. So it's important sometimes to review what the normal um, menstrual pattern really is with our patients. Ovulatory bleeding is characterized by amenorrhea, and it can range all the way from amenorrhea to heavy, irregular menstrual periods. Sometimes this is caused by a spectrum of disorders. Uh, it's a type of endocrinopathy, as we see with PCOS. The abnormal uterine bleeding is usually related to the unopposed estrogen, and the mechanism for that is when there's an increased or abnormal prostaglandin synthesis, the blood vessels in the endometrium open up and there's increased bleeding locally. So sometimes we treat this or can treat this with prostaglandins, and this is a reason that, that we can recommend NSAIDs to our patient if they're having um, this type of bleeding. Some interesting facts about abnormal uterine bleeding is that one-third of all patient visits to gynecologists are related to abnormal uterine bleeding, and 70% are during the perimenopausal uh, leading up to the menopausal years. 20% of women presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding have some type of bleeding disorder. So if your woman comes in um, with heavy bleeding, we need to make sure that that's part of her differential diagnosis. And especially in the adolescence, we have to consider coagulopathies. Just a sidebar, a note here that I wanted to put in, because some of these patients with abnormal uterine bleeding will undergo an endometrial ablation. We want to remember if they come back in clinic or we see them at any point in time after that, that endometrial ablation does not provide contraception and more than likely they're going to need some other type of contraception. There are multiple causes for post-coital bleeding and this is a very important um, thing that we need to review right now and there, because there are so many different causes. Postcoital bleeding usually represents benign disease, but because there is the possibility of an underlying malignancy, then it has to be evaluated. 30% of these women with postcoital bleeding will also experience some other type of abnormal uterine bleeding, and about 15% of these women will have some, some dyspareunia with um, their abnormal uterine bleeding. This is a red flag for us. If this patient has postcoital bleeding, then some type of tickler system needs to be in place. This patient needs to be followed up. 
We need to recognize what tests we've done, if we've done cultures or a pap smear. We want to make sure that we follow up on this about the patient. We don't need to tell our patients um, to, that no news is good news. They really need to come back in to get their test results. Uh, we don't want them to be lost to follow up, and even if their tests are negative, and we need to ask them if they're still having the problem with postcoital bleeding. If they are, then they more than likely um, they need some additional uh, follow-up, as this could be a harbinger for some type of dysplastic disease. So make sure that you get these patients into a, some type of tickler system. Postcoital bleeding can be a result of benign growth, like endometrial polyps or even uh, cervical polyps or cervical ectropion. It can be due to infection like cervicitis or endometritis or vaginitis. And uh, Nasa is going to be talking about some of these in just a minute. It can be due to some genital or vulvar lesions like herpes or even condyloma. Uh, it can be due to benign conditions like atrophy or endometri endometriosis. But it can be a malignancy like cervical or endometrial cancer, and we really need to pay attention to these patients and hone in on their symptoms. One other thing that we cannot forget is that postcoital bleeding can be a result of trauma from sexual abuse or foreign bodies. And um, a really good article that just came out in August that NASA posted, uh, one of the NP articles, it's on the AD. PH website in the document library. Uh, it's very important. It reviews all of these um, problems with postcoital bleeding. So there is a vast array with this, and you can see that differential diagnosis is important to help narrow down our decision. And this is my sweet little Annabeth. She's two years old in this picture, and she is quite the diva. She's the only girl out of and has eight other uh, cousins that are boys. And she's one of the reasons that I do what I do. I want to see uh, healthy women in Alabama and healthy children, and I know that most of our nurse practitioners want to do the same thing. They want the same thing. So ACOG helps us to look at abnormal uterine bleeding in age categories, and it's a very helpful way to do this and help us make this diagnosis of abnormal uterine bleeding and especially how we're going to manage these patients in the reproductive period. Younger patients may have persistent anovulation due to the immaturity or dysregulation of the, um, of the uh, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. And this can, can be um, usually a normal physiology. As a general rule, we would not refer these patients out for further studies, but it is something we need to pay attention to. Um, the other causes could be hormonal contraceptive use, pregnancy complications, um, pelvic infection, coagulopathies, and tumors in the 13 to 18 year olds. As we move to the 19 to 39 years, there can be other things like pregnancy, structural lesions, um, like polyps. Uh, it could be anovulatory cycles like what we see with PCOS, the hormonal contraception, or again, endometrial hyperplasia or carcinoma. In the 40 years to menopause, we do see the declining ovarian function, which may cause anovulatory bleeding, and especially we need to pay attention to, uh, to signs and symptoms the patients are having in their complaints because of the endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. They may also have um, uterine fibroids or atrophy. This is an algorithm by M.G. Monroe that was in the 2012 July ACOG Practice Bulletin. It shows the evaluation process, the urine um, evaluation process from the start of um, the endometrial or the vaginal bleeding and works all the way through evaluation of the endometrium. We're going to start with um, our case study. Um, probably, I had several case studies, but I'm probably not going to get to the maybe one or two, and then we'll move on. Um, but the first one I want to talk about is a 16-year-old who came in with complaints of heavy, prolonged bleeding for about eight days. She also was having increased cramping. Um, she tells us that her 
past menstrual periods were normal. Her periods usually last about 26 to 28 days. Her periods varied a little bit, but sometimes she had clots with her periods. What I do want to say about this particular slide is sometimes we try to evaluate our patient's bleeding with uh, how many pads or tampons they're using. We can't really use that as a guide because some patients are more fastidious than others and they may change more frequently. A good gauge for us is their hemoglobin and their other symptoms as I mentioned before. Another thing we need, do need to talk with these patients about is the clots and the consistency of their bleeding. This may give us a better perspective on how much they're bleeding. We also, again, need to look at their pallor, their uh, con uh, conjunctiva, their nail beds, and other symptoms that they may be having. We need to ask the relevant questions of these patients, um, especially about sexual activity, vaginal discharge, their history of pregnancy, miscarriage, and abortion. Sometimes that won't be listed on our CHR-12. They may be reluctant to give a complete history, but we need to reassure them that we need everything or ask, have all the information when it comes to their, to their health care. We want to talk generally about their medical and family history. Again, I mentioned that, that if their mom had heavy uterine bleeding, if she had clots, if there's another family member that had the same um, symptoms, then these can be really relevant to what's going on with these patients. So be sure and ask those questions. The physical exam for this 16-year-old was normal with the exception that she had some suprapubic tenderness with deep palpation. Her speculum exam was noted to have large blood clots and heavy bleeding. The cervix was closed, but her cervical motion tenderness was, um, was positive. Remember, as we check cervical motion tenderness, that this is chandelier sign, and we should ask our patients gauge th that pain on a scale of zero to five. So what's your... Um, so the differential diagnosis for this patient could be either PID or pelvic infection. She could have a missed AB. She could have some kind of clotting disorder, possible UTI, or some other type problem that we don't yet know about. We want to know what tests needs to be done, and I've just listed those. those we are very limited in public health as to what we can do. And, um, you know, if we do exhaust all of these and nothing seems to give us the answer to our problem, then we would need to refer that patient. But as we, the patient was not able to get a urine specimen for us before her physical exam, but we finally got a specimen and it revealed a positive uh, pregnancy test. Her hemoglobin also was a 7.2, and so that really tells us a little bit more about our clinical decision. This patient was referred to the emergency room. She was seen by a gynecologist there, and they did further testing, and sure enough, she had a missed abortion, and her test, he tested her for von Willebrand's, and she tested positive for that. I just want to uh, review what the cardinal symptoms were for this patient. She had heavy bleeding for eight days. She had cramping with clots. She had nausea, and she told us initially that she had not had, uh, that she had never been sexually active, but she did admit that she had a boyfriend but broke up with him about a month ago, and she did tell the, nurse, uh, the nurses that she um, had not used any contraception. So these are the causes for heavy menstrual bleeding in this particular patient, and we use those or utilize those as we're doing our um, um, differential diagnosis. I'm going to kind of skip through case two and move on to case five. Um, this is a very, I have included some additional things in there for you. One was a, a list on thyroid because one of our cases did have thyroid, an abnormal thyroid. But I am going to, for the sake of time, move on to case study number five. Initially, this was a patient who came in a while back that was a 59-year-old, gravid 8, para 2. She presented for a cancer detection initial visit. She reported her last monthly period was 10 to 15 years ago, but she tells us she spotted about two weeks ago for one day. Then the next day she had some pain in one side, and then she spotted a little bit again. 
Uh, she tells us that her last uh, sexual encounter was 10 years ago. What I want to say about this patient is that this bleeding is postmenopausal bleeding. Once the patient has ceased her periods for one year, she is considered to be menopausal. Any spotting or bleeding after that point in time is considered postmenopausal bleeding, if it, even if it was one spot one day. The medical history for this 59-year-old at that time was non-contributory, but we did note that her mother had ovarian cancer in her 70s. Her physical findings on that day were normal with the exception of there was some uh, pale atrophic mucosa and she had some pink tinged creamy vaginal discharge. The assessment plan for that patient w was that she had a normal GYN exam with atrophic vaginitis. The patient was instructed to follow up for an evaluation of this atrophic vaginitis with her physician. So we're going to fast forward just a little bit. The patient didn't come in for a year or so, and she comes back in at age 61 for her follow-up annual exam. She tells us that she's wearing a pad daily, and she's been having vaginal bleeding for four months. The physical exam was normal with the exception of an erythematous vulva. She also exhibited an atrophic vagina with erythematous mucosa. She had pooling of blood-tinged serous fluid in the vaginal canal. So what is your differential diagnosis? High on the differential for this patient would be endometrial cancer. And remember that postmenopausal bleeding is always considered cancer until proven otherwise. This patient was referred and she was found to have adenocarcinoma on her endometrial biopsy. Um, if you have any feelings at all about something amiss going on with your patients, I want to remind you that referral sometimes is the best management action for these patients. And certainly it never hurts to consult with our collaborating physician. According to ACOG, endometrial cancer is the most common diagnosis, diagnosed gynecologic malignancy. The epidemiology and risk factors are very chilling. Um, the, the statistics are that in the United States, almost 55,000 women will be diagnosed with endometrial cancer during 2015 and subsequently 10,000 of those women will die from this disease. It is a very chilling statistics. We have to remember if our patients have unopposed estrogen, if they're a type 2 diabetic or hypertensive, if they're obese, if they smoke, all of those things contribute to our risk factors for women with um, endometrial carcinoma. The most common symptom of endometrial cancer is abnormal uterine bleeding, either irregular periods or intermenstrual bleeding or postmenopausal bleeding. This is a slide that I took last week. It's called the All-American Spirit Monument. It's in Gadsden, Alabama. I made this slide because I want to tell you that you're on the front lines and I feel like you have the All-American spirit too. You do a great job and you work so hard for the women in Alabama. I am going to list my references, but I also had um, some ICD-10 codes for you for endometrial bleeding. And then I want to come to the sunset at Daytona Beach and I'm going to turn this program over to Nasa Hernandez. Thanks, Ebra. Good morning. The objective of my presentation is to identify the treatments and recommendations for the management of sexual health and clinical issues according to the 2015 CDC guidelines. This information is an update from the treatment guidelines from 2010. And remember, we as healthcare providers have daily opportunities to help promote behavioral changes with our patients to help prevent sexually transmitted infections. And remember these too. These recommendations are to be used as a guidance. They are tools, not rules. As healthcare providers, we need to tailor these to each patient according to their specific 
clinical presentation. The first change that we're going to talk about is the alternative treatment regimen for gonorrhea. Before we go into treatment, I want you to know that gonorrhea is the second most commonly reported infectious disease, with chlamydia being the number one. In 2013, Alabama had the second highest rate of gonorrhea in the nation, according to CDC. And four of the five states with the highest prevalence are in the south. And this map here shows you uh, reported cases by state. And as you can see, the bottom line, the dark blue south states have the highest rate, uh, including some of the northeast states as well. As of 2013, Alabama was second. Right now, I just got the numbers for 2014, and even though nationwide there was an increase seen in cases reported gonorrhea, syphilis, and chlamydia, as a state, Alabama moved down to six on gonorrhea cases. So we're moving in the right direction here, still in the top ten, but doing a little bit better. Um, this table here shows uh, report cases by age and sex as of 2013. On the left side, we have the men, which 20 to 24 years old is the highest uh, prevalence of gonorrhea. And on the right side, for females, we go from young adolescents to young women, 15 to 24 years old. And this is as of 2013 as well. Gonorrhea has progressively developed resistance to each of the antimicrobials used for its treatment, okay? And this continues to be a significant public health concern. Back in 1993, fluoroquinolones and cephalosporins were the only treatments for gonorrhea. By 2006, there was already a resistance against Cipro. And by 2007, CDC stopped the use of Cipro, and the only treatment available at that time was ceftriaxone or cefixim. In 2010, they recommended dual therapy of ceftriaxone plus Zitromax or doxycycline. And right now, in 2015, we are treating with azithromycin over doxycycline. And the reason for this, number one, it's more convenient to do azithromycin and we see more compliance rate because it's a one-time dose against seven um, days of doxycycline. Now, the treatment for gonorrhea used to be ceftriaxone plus azithromycin or doxycycline, like I just said, but doxycycline was moved to alternative regimen. So right now, we treat with rosefin plus Zitromax, and we're going to do this even if the chlamydia test is negative. Pregnant females. This is current ADPH protocol. No changes were made here. We still treat with rosefin plus Zitromax, and because they're pregnant, we need to retest these patients three to four weeks after treatment. Now, um, this is alternative regimen for pregnant female in the event that we do not have access to Zitromax or that the patient is allergic to azithromycin. We're going to treat with ceftriaxone plus amoxicillin, and again, we're going to repeat the test in three to four weeks. Now, in the true case of penicillin or cephalosporin allergy, and by this I mean anaphylactic type of reaction, okay, and this is a sudden, widespread, potentially severe, life-threatening reaction. And with this type of reaction, patients sometimes can have symptoms such as generalized itching, hives, swelling, wheezing, difficulty breathing, and so on, okay? So if your patient has this type of reaction, CDC does have treatment in place, okay? And it is gentamicin plus Zitromax or gemifloxacin plus Zitromax. Now, I want you to know this is CDC protocol. In our protocol, we do not have these guidelines. Right now, if your patient does have a true penicillin or cephalosporin allergy, you are to call your designated physician or central office, and the names and phone numbers are listed here per area. Okay? So you need to call the physician. They want to know what's going on, and they will help you determine what kind of treatment uh, your patient will need. 
Second change um, is the treatment of chlamydia infection during pregnancy. Before we go into treatment, let me tell you that chlamydia, like we said before, is one of the most free, it is the most frequently reported infection disease, and the prevalence is higher in persons less than 25 years old. Annual screening is recommended. However, if you have any female older than 25 that is high risk, has multiple sex partners, has a new sex partner, or her sex partner has other sex partners, it is important that you screen these people as well, okay? Remember, on females, any untreated chlamydia or gonorrhea are a common cause of PID. And PID is the major cause of ectopic pregnancy, infertility, and chronic abdominal pain in females. So they need to be screened very well. This is a similar map, um, but this is on chlamydia, reported cases by state as 2013. Um, when it comes to chlamydia, we were third as of 2013. As of 2014, we moved down to four. So it's a little bit better as well. Um, you can see the highest states are in the south, midwest, and the northeast. And the same table for chlamydia according to age. On the left, males 20 to 24 is the highest prevalence and females from 15 to 24. Chlamydia treatment remains the same. No changes here. It's going to be Zitromax or doxycycline. Um, some randomized clinical trial was done uh, comparing Zitromax and doxycycline treatment. They were both equally effective. So that's why you can use one or the other. Now this is the change. Pregnant females, chlamydia treatment. We're going to treat these patients with Zitromax. Before, it was Zitromax or amoxicillin. Amoxicillin now has been moved to alternative regimen. So we're going to treat with Zitromax and repeat the test again in three to four weeks. Um, number three is talking about the use of nucleic acid amplification test for the diagnosis of trichomonas. Trichomonas is the most common non-viral sexually transmitted infection in the U.S. So it is very important that we use a highly sensitive and specific test. And what does that mean? Sensitivity is the ability of the test to identify all the patients that have the disease. So if we have a test with 100% sensitivity, it's picking up all the patients that have the disease. If it's 80% sensitivity, it identifies 80% of patients that have the disease, which is a true uh, result, true negative result. And the other 20%, they do have the disease, but they're not identified. So it's going to show as negative or a false negative because they do have the disease. And the specificity identifies the patients without the disease. And those tests, the Optima test, which is the one that we use at the DPH, excellent sensitivity and specificity, 95 to 100 percent, okay? Now, even though we do use the test with the highest sensitivity and specificity, if you have a patient that shows up to the clinic and is symptomatic, you're going to do a wet prep. The sensitivity of a wet mount is only 55, 51 to 65 percent but it's readily available in the clinic, so we need to do a wet prep on them. And I also want to mention that even though trichomonas can be an incidental finding on a pap test, neither the conventional or liquid-based pap are diagnostic tests for trichomonas. So you are going to do a wet prep, and you're going to treat them, and you're going to collect a specimen as well. Treatment for trichomonas remains the same, metronidazole or tinidazole, and the alternative, metronidazole for seven days. If the patient pregnant, same treatment, metronidazole, repeat the test in three to four weeks. Let's talk a little bit about mycoplasma in urethritis and cervicitis cases and the treatment-related implications, and this is just for your information. This is not an our ADPH protocol. Um, this is an organism that was identified in the early 1980s, 
can be sexually transmitted, and it is the cause of 15 to 20 percent cases of non-gonococcal urethritis in males and 20 to 25 percent of non-chlamydial non-gonococcal urethritis. The pathogenic role in women is unclear, but may play a role in cervicitis and PID. It can be found in the vagina, in the cervix, endometrium, and like gonorrhea and chlamydia, is the only, mycoplasma can be the only pathogen detected, but co-infection with chlamydia is not uncommon. Very slow growing organism, a culture can take up to six months, and the NAAT is the preferred method. But NAAT tests are available only in some large medical facilities and commercial labs. As of now, there is no diagnostic test for mycoplasma that has been cleared by the FDA to be used in the United States. And the treatment for urethritis and cervicitis is a single dose of Zitromax. They say that some resistance is rapidly emerging, and you can treat with moxifloxacin, but um, only few studies have been done with this drug. Great results, but has not been tested in clinical trials. Another change um, is the additional treatment for uh, genital wart. CDC added imiquimod 3.75 cream to the recommended patient applied treatment. This is not in our ADPH protocol either. Our guidelines remain the same. We treat with TCA or podophylin, and the alternative will be podophilus, imiquimod 5%, or over-the-counter 15% ointment. And pedophilin resin, CDC moved these to the alternative regimen because of some cases of um, severe toxicity when the drug was misused and applied to large areas of friable tissue and it was not washed off within four hours. Let's talk about HPV vaccines and the recommendations. HPV is the most common STI in the United States. Right now, there's three vaccines that are approved for the HPV. The bivalent was approved in 2009 for female use, and it protects against 16, type 16 and 18. And these two types cause 75% of cervical cancer. Then we have the quadrivalent that was approved by the FDA in 2006 for females, and in 2009, this one was also approved for males. It covers the 16 and 18, and the 6 and 11, which cause 90% of genital warts. And the 9-valent was just recently approved in 2014 for males and females. It covers all the ones in the quadrivalent, plus 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. Now, Gardasil 9, of course, it protects against cervical, vaginal, and vulvar cancer in females and anal cancer in males and females. And it also prevents genital warts. Now, we want to routinely vaccinate these males and females beginning at 11 or 12. However, you can start as early as 9, okay? On females, you can go 9 to 26, and on males, you can go 9 to 21, but you can give up to 26 years old if you have a man that has sex with other men or that is an immunocompromised man, like an HIV positive. We can go up to 26. And there's a handout that I have here. It is not in your handout, but I want to show it. And it's just um, showing uh, overhead. Get it straight. Okay, so this is just to show you um, all the vaccines that can begin at 11 to 12 years old, like the Tdap, uh, with a booster 10 years later. Then we have the HPV. We have the meningococcal that we can start at 11 and 12 years old as well. And then we have the flu vaccine that we can start this as early as six months old. Okay, so going back to the slides. The schedule, you have to have a three series dose, a three dose series of the HPV. You give the first dose now, you do the second one, one to two months after the first one, and the third one will be six months after the first 
those, okay? Now, this is some work that we need to do. There's some tips here of how you need to talk to the parents about the HPV vaccine. I want you to recommend this vaccine the same way you recommend other adolescent vaccines like the Tdap, meningococcal, and so on, okay? You can tell the parents something like, your child needs these shots today, and you're going to mention all those shots that you can give that day, including the HPV. Don't treat HPV any different than any of the others. Um, HPV vaccine is cancer prevention. This is a strong message that resonates very well with parents. And you can tell them something like HPV is important because it prevents cancer, and I want your child to be protected against cancer, and that's why I am recommending that he or she gets these vaccines today, okay? Um, parents sometimes may ask, why vaccinate at such a young age, 11 to 12 years old? Well, we, you can tell them that we're vaccinated now so your child can have the best protection possible long before they start having any kind of sexual activity. And of course, we vaccinate people well before they are exposed to the infection, as it is the case of the measles vaccine. Okay? And sometimes parents may be concerned that if you vaccinate this early, uh, your child can see this as permission to start having sex. Well, research has shown that getting the HPV vaccine does not make kids more likely to have sex or to start having sex at a younger age. As of 2014, according to a CDC survey, 60% of adolescent girls and 42% of boys have received one or more dose of the HPV vaccine. Now, this was an increase of 3% for girls and 8% for boys from 2013. But even though the rate is a little bit higher, it's not high enough. The number of females diagnosed with cervical cancer is not as high today as it was 40 years ago, but in 2012, over 12,000 women in the U.S. were diagnosed with cervical cancer, and out of those, over 4,000 died of cervical cancer. So I think we, as public health workers, need to do a better job immunizing and educating parents and uh, patients. And I have some numbers here. As of 2014, in the U.S., Less than 22% of boys between 13 and 17 years old have completed the three-dose series of HPV. Less than 40% of girls have completed the series. Now, when you look at these numbers, this may sound good, but when you look at other places like England, where 87% of girls between 12 and 13 have completed the series as of August 2014, I think there's a lot of room here for improvement. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This principle has been applied to many fields, but it is central to public health. It embodied best by the practice of immunization. And remember, uh, when it comes to HPV, vaccination is not a substitute for cervical cancer screening. This does not protect against all the HPV types that can cause cervical cancer, so females need to have the regular pap smears. And another recommendation for the CDC is um, to annually screen for hepatitis C males that have sex with males that are HIV positive or any other risk factors. And a new section for transgender individuals was added to the special population section of the CDC. Um, clinicians should assess STD and HIV and HIV related risk for the transgender patients. And we need to do this based on anatomy, current anatomy, and sexual behavior. We have the trans women which identify as a woman but was born as a man. So this group, we need to treat them the same way we treat men that have sex with other men. The trans men identify as a man but was born as a woman. This is a very diverse group, both in anatomy and behavior. And keep in mind, with this group of people, 
you still need to consider the risk for vaginal and cervical disease and cervical cancer. And this concludes my presentation of the 2015 STI CDC guidelines update. If you have questions, please call us. We're open for questions at this time. And we thank you all for your participation. Let me see. We don't have any. Um, no questions? Um, we don't have any phone calls either. Mm -hmm. okay. We can give it a couple of minutes, I guess. Okay. But, um, that was just an excellent, excellent presentation, ladies. I really, we, I'm sure we all learned a lot. I know I did, and we appreciate all your hard work and um, being able to um, present this, all this great information for us and, and for our viewers. And uh, we'll wait maybe just a, another minute or so to see if anyone happens to call in. But um, can anyone, does anyone have any questions in the audience or... Uh, any comments or anything? I'll have to admit that uh, NASA, um, that last slide that with the flags, um, she had some her flags flying there, but I had to put the Alabama flags in there too. So, um, but we appreciate all your hard work. You did such a good job. And if there, of course, if there are any questions uh, afterwards. Uh, you can submit them uh, through the system with the um, uh, email address that are, is uh, listed on the uh, slides. And um, if that's all we need for this afternoon, we will close. Is there a question? I, I just want to comment. Y'all did an excellent job today. Thank and you. It, what, what I enjoyed is that you reinforced about the tickler system because a lot of times we think just the tickler system is only for what we call abnormal, or, but talking about the benign findings right. and, you know, our need to follow up with our patients. So that was very helpful for me to, you know, change my mindset about that as well. So that was great information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, this will be available um, on demand um, in a couple of days. So, um, again, thank you all for, uh, for um, tuning in today and uh, be sure to complete your evaluations and your sign-in sheets and send those in. And um, we'll close with that. Thank you very much.